The issue came out of a conference that was held at the Royal Society last May 2014 and what we wanted to do was to represent some of the really interesting and wide-ranging thinking that the papers um, in that conference and to represent them properly. We wanted to um, recover women and have an element of biography of women that um, perhaps most people may not have heard of. We also wanted to look at the way that the history of science is actually written because it tends not to be written about in a way that women are, are included. You know, there's certain areas like the domestic area where women worked and women tend to get left out of histories of science. If you're just, for example, looking at the Fellowship of the Royal Society, um, you wouldn't find any women. But look elsewhere, and certainly around 1900, you'll find a lot of women who are working at the periphery. So we wanted to really interrogate the way the history of science is understood. Um, and thirdly, we really wanted to question the attitudes we sometimes have to science today. And I think one of the examples um, of the scientist Margaret Fontaine, who was also a traveller, and she's been written about as some wild and fearless eccentric woman going off hunting butterflies, when she was very much within the norm for a privileged woman of her sex and what she did at the time. So I think there's sort of three things that we wanted to um, enlighten about, really. From what the William and Caroline write about in terms of their childhood, uh, they both went to the same school, and so they both, although I think, I mean, it's difficult to know exactly what was taught in the school, but the general trend at the time was that girls and boys were, they were taught to read and write, but within that, the other subjects that they were taught at school did tend to differ. But then outside school, William and his brothers are all trained to become musicians, so they put in hours and hours of practice. When their father's around, they give them lessons. It's all very, very much focused on turning them into professional musicians. Caroline's after-school activities are completely different, so she learns how to run the house with her, with her mother. Um, when she does get lessons, so sometimes she does get the occasional outside lesson, but they tend to be very domestic. I mean, she does, she occasionally gets to do a little bit of music or a little bit of, you know, they do little astronomy projects now and then, but that's kind of very much kind of special treat compared to her day-to-day -day routine, which is this heavy domestic work, which she then has to apply. So she not only learns how to do it, but she has to apply it very quickly. Dar Darwin's Origin of Species came out in 1859, and he didn't say anything about the human race in that book, but when he later on, he wrote a book called The Descent of Man, and he made it very, very clear that over generations and generations, millennia going back, men have been selected to go out hunting, to, to do all the thinking sort of work. Women had been progressively selected to stay at home and look after the children and do all what we now regard as a traditional feminine domestic work. And so Darwin said it's scientifically impossible for women to be equal. They, they, have, they have become different and they can't possibly intellectually carry out the same work as men. So yes, I think Darwin had an enormous amount mm. to answer for. It's quite a common process in science, I think, uh, that a scientist looks at the world around him and sees, for example, that women are inferior and, and men are superior in the society around him. And then he looks at the natural world, for example, Linnaeus looked at, at plants or Darwin looked at animals, and they interpret the animals or the plants in that biased social way. And then they turn around and say, oh, look, it's happening in the, in the natural world, therefore it must be happening in the human world. So you get this sort of full circular logic that reinforces uh, social preconceptions and justifies them in the name of science. My area is in the decades around 1900, and this is when the universities have been opening up to women. So there was, oh, I found about 60 articles by women, um, co-authored and sort of single authored in the transactions and the proceedings up to the First World War. Um, so often they were endorsed by a man who may be a tutor at university or co-written, but not all of them by any extent. So in a sense they were kind of accepted, they kind of got their foot in the door. Women were accepted more if they were writing their science for um, amateurs or lay people or children and there seemed to be a little niche that sometimes women fitted into that they they wrote 
you know, almost a teaching capacity and they wrote their science that way and that was sort of generally accepted because it fell within the norms of femininity, certainly in the second half of the 19th century. Just before World War I there weren't very many women in science. At an institution like Imperial College, for example, there were quite a few women carrying out research. What they weren't allowed to do was lecture. Um, women were very well treated in Cambridge because Newnham College, which was a women's only college, set up the Balfour Laboratory, which was restricted to women, which meant that women got plenty of experience in carrying out research in leading research groups. And the laboratory was closed down as soon as the war started in 1914, because then when all the men went off to war, that left room in the university laboratories for the, for the women to train there. So I think there were isolated pockets where women did have opportunities, but they were very different from what the men were enjoying. I think men were taken by surprise at the beginning of the war how many jobs women could do. It was really very late in the war that women were sent abroad. I mean, the, the role of women was to stay at home. OK, they could work in the factories here, but the idea that they could go abroad or that they w could work near the front was something that seemed um, absolutely forbidden. And the marvellous counter-example of that is the whole group of doctors who raised money through the suffragist movement and went out to the Eastern Front. We were far too ready to think of the Western Front, what was happening in France, but there were these marvellous doctors who were out in Salonika and Serbia and Russia and experiencing the most appalling conditions. And they, they were doing very hard physical work. They were, do, they were carrying out um, a lot of surgery, obviously, during wartime, and traditionally in, in England or in Europe, surgery was seen as being a male speciality, but during the war, they were out there doing it. Speaking as a historian, it's very difficult to think our ways into um, how they thought then. And, and people sometimes say to me, oh, it's, you know, it was so sexist then, but it wasn't because it was a different mindset and different understandings. Is it now? Well, Certainly when I look at popular science, I sometimes think um, even if it doesn't exclude women totally, it's kind of got a masculine feeling to it, um, which sometimes I think women sit a little oddly in. There's an excellent example in conception. So the traditional masculine way about, of thinking about conception is that there's an egg and there's all these very fast energetic sperm and they're all competing like knights mm. to break down the walls of the castle and get inside the egg and fertilise it. But there's the feminine interpretation of exactly the same chemical process, is that the egg is sitting there and the egg is sort of looking around at all these sperm and the egg sees a sperm that she really quite likes and she temporarily lowers her chemical defences and pulls the sperm in. And I think that's a really good example of how you can look at the same physical phenomenon that's happening out in nature. And you can interpret it in a masculine way or you can interpret it in a feminine way. I think at the end of the war, women, in a way, a lot of women felt psychologically different because they had demonstrated that they could carry out the work of men. So I think there was a sort of collective feeling that they were certainly very, very capable of doing the work. There was a lot of legislation which, and also general attitudes which prevented them working. There was massive unemployment. So a lot of people felt that married women should not take away the work of married men. Uh, single, single women were more tolerated in the workplace, but married women certainly weren't. And until I think the late 20s or 30s, I'm not sure, if you were married, you couldn't, um, if you became married, you could no longer be either a teacher or a civil mm. servant. And that was the excuse that the Royal Society used for preventing women from joining the society in the early 20th century. And other, other societies got round that problem by changing their statutes. And the Royal Society could have done it mm. if it had wanted to, but it refused to. Um, to do it with Hertha Rett and, and I mean it was another it was another 30 or 40 years before the first women um, yeah. became fellows so I'm, I'm afraid I'm not sure if I should say it in this hallowed room <laughs> but I'm afraid the Royal Society was definitely behind a lot of other scientific societies mm. in Britain and they could have changed earlier if they had wanted absolutely. to. Absolutely and even after 1919 when the Sets Disqualification Act um, came in which, which a lot of opened up a lot of professions and things yes. to women and the, the Royal Society still didn't didn't act. <laughs>